Are we? Yes. Where are we? Here. Why are we here? Not entirely clear. We are misfits thrust into existence by random chance with no hints at all as to how we're supposed to make sense of it all. It's immensely bizarre. Here we are. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Here We Are podcast. I'm Shane Moss. Today, we are talking with author of the book, De-Escalate, How to Calm an Angry Person in 90 Seconds or Less. Douglas Knoll is joining me today. Do you prefer Doug or Douglas? Doug is fine. Okay. Should have asked that ahead of time. How are you doing today, Doug? I'm doing great. I just got off my tractor, broke, I busted off my three point while I'm moving dirt. So I'm doing good. Now. Where are you in California again? <laughs> I live in rural California, about 60 miles plus or minus south of Yosemite National Park and about 40 miles west of King's Sequoia National Parks in the central Sierra Nevada. Nice. One of the most beautiful places in the world. All right. Getting on tractors and doing things. That sounds yeah. sounds incredible. What's uh what is your background? I am a lawyer turned peacemaker. Probably haven't heard of that before. Uh, <laughs> uh I, I was a trial lawyer for 22 years and then through a series of events that we may or may not want to talk about, I went back to school in my 40s and earned my master's degree in peacemaking and conflict studies and left the practice of law in 2000 to become a mediator and a peacemaker. And that's my academic I've published four books. I've got a bunch of scholarly articles. I teach graduate school at Pepperdine University, the Strauss Institute of Dispute Resolution. I've been, been a law professor. And the my biggest challenge after leaving the practice of law was figuring out what to do with really angry people. Interesting. Because I was getting called, I was getting paid big bucks and called into these really difficult conflicts, hmm. often ideological, identity based, uh, and people were really pissed at each other. And none of the stuff that I had learned or had read about worked. What What were you getting called into? What kind of conflicts and very why? what I would call deep and intractable ideological and identity conflicts. So ideological, where people are having conflicting ideologies or conflicting beliefs, mm -hmm. or um, identity conflicts are where people's identities have been threatened, and so they are on the edge of violence, getting ready to duke it out. And I get called into these situations, and they're in bizarre circumstances. Sometimes they're in families, sometimes they're in businesses, sometimes they're in communities. Sometimes they're in nonprofit organizations, but the but the leadership has allowed the conflict to grow to a place where it's no longer manageable. And so I get called in to see what I can do to help restore peace, restore relationships, and so help people solve their problems. Amazing. And prevent it from happening again. That's what I do for a living, it's, among many other things. But yeah. yeah, you work with prisoners as well, right? That's correct. Can you talk a little bit in about that? Yeah, in 2010, my colleague Laurel Coffer and I responded to a letter from a woman who was serving a life sentence without possibility of parole in the largest, most violent women's prison in the world, asking if we would come in and train lifers and long-termers, women, to be peacemakers and mediators because they were tired of prison violence. And we said yes. And that was the beginning of the Prison of Peace Project. And today... We're in 15 California prisons, a prison in Connecticut, 12 prisons in Greece, and we have startups in northern Italy and in Kenya. And just before I came on the show, I was reviewing uh, our footage. We spent we spent all summer filming our curriculum because of the pandemic. We haven't been able to work in prisons for 18 months. Mm -hmm. So we filmed everything. We got our entire curriculum on film. And probably early next year, the Prison of Peace curriculum will be available to any prison in the world. We're really excited about that. Wow. That's, a, that's it, It's incredible. And just to speak to some of the results, we've had about 2,000 of our inmates released on parole around the world. Not one of them is reoffended. Not a single one. That's incredible. So one. what? Well, let's talk about that journey. How? Sure. How in the heck? Yeah, <clears throat> break it down. How did you get into it? What did you learn along the way? Oh. Uh, that's, <laughs> how many days do we have? <laughs> I mean, so so this is after. So so we're we're talking about okay. So 2010. That's 11 years ago. So so you had already 
at this time, you you it had been a while since you had already made this career change and were in, Correct. into peacemaking at the time and right. and had established yourself doing other things and then and so so I'm sorry how did this person find you in the first place you were kind of known well, for some of this work we're both Laurel and I are both very well known in our fields okay. internationally and uh Susan Russo the woman who wrote the letter was actually recuperating from some surgery and somebody some staff person in the prison apparently went on the internet and got a list of mediator trainers and Laurel's name came up and as we understand it, Susan wrote 50 letters and the last letter went to Laurel and we were the only ones to respond. Laurel called me in August of 2009, yeah, 2009 and said, I got this letter to read to you. And the reason she called me is because we're close friends and also I'm, I live fairly close to the prison. So, and I'm a secondary black belt. So she thought, <laughs> and obviously a good, a great mediation trainer and teacher and professor because we were both taught at Pepperdine. And read me the letter and I said, you know, if this is for real, I think we should do this. Mm. So that's how it started. And our intention has always been to, to do two things. One, to teach lifers and long-termers how to be peacemakers and mediators, because they're the, they're the leaders in the prisons as a general rule. They're going to be there for a long time, not necessarily for life, but for a long time. And our second goal was to train them how to be trainers themselves so that prison of peace would become internally sustainable and embedded in whatever prison we were in. So we wouldn't have to keep going back. And it, we've learned that it takes us about three years to embed the program in a prison before it becomes sustainable <clears throat> and it becomes enormously popular. Uh, we teach, we don't teach, we only teach science backed, skills that we've developed over, we, we've either learned or developed, it's all science-based, and we are focused on teaching them how to serve others. So our tagline is from a sentence of life to a life of service. And what we want, we, we all we are doing is teaching them how to be peacemakers and mediators, how to go in and stop violence, stop fights and arguments before things escalate out of control, mm -hmm. or if things have escalated out of control and the correctional staff haven't responded, how to bring things back to order without violence. And we are both very experienced teachers and trainers and professors. And so we had a broad base of knowledge to work from. We understood that going into a prison and working with an inmate population, incarcerated population, we didn't know what we were going to be dealing with. We didn't, and it turns out we were right. We, we, you know, the education level varies from zero to graduate school. Uh, Obviously, high high levels of diversity in terms of ethnicity, age, uh, mental capacity, intellectual capacity. Mm. So we assume we walked in as we devised the curriculum. We walked in assuming nothing, and we started with very very basic skills like how to listen. And so, and that's where we started introducing my my de escalation skills is in the very first day teaching people how to listen to and reflect emotions, and. We didn't know what was going to happen. And all we got was just astounding results. Every time, I mean, for the first four or five weeks, it was tough. It was hard on me because, let's see, I was 60 years old at the time. Mm. Can you imagine starting something like this at that age? And, and a white Anglo-Saxon lawyer, big man, I'm 6'1", 215 pounds, big man. Secondary black belt, nobody takes, I don't take shit from anybody. <laughs> and so I can be very intimidating. And... Uh, it was a very humbling experience working with the women. Mm. And, and now, uh, th it, that's four to five weeks. That seems like a very short amount of time to accomplish results. Because e even even with your experience, I would love to know the difference between uh, conflict resolution in uh, the regular um, uh, life, going into businesses or mm -hmm. uh, the or within family conflicts or whatever and prisons where i mean a, a business boy it seems like you can always like 
walk away or move to a different department. That's of, right. And uh, e- even family. I have I have plenty of family that I'm like, ah, I don't see eye to eye with this person. Right. You know what? I'll just not see them so much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, right. and that works out just that. fine. And in, in, right. in prison, it's you might have to sleep in a bunk bed with so I don't know if they have bunk beds in, oh, in yeah. the prison it, it, next to or, the person that you have the most conflict with and you might right. have to do that for 30 years that's right it, it's and i it, have all intense. sorts of dunning kruger ish uh thoughts and feelings about well, private prison and and i i can't believe the the length of some of these sentences and but all, all right. that is all that's besides the point from um, from your point of view, you're dealing with what you have, um, and so so. What were some of the uh, uh, what were some of the the things that you had to learn and differences between those? Well, groups? first of all, the, the the initial when we did the initial workshop, it was 12 weeks from start to finish, and <clears throat> we we about killed ourselves doing it. We go in every week for four to four to six hours, some sometimes all day, mm-hmm. and we learned very quickly that that's too much, too fast. And so today, that 12-week workshop is spread out over a year. Okay. And so there's a lot more time for integration of the material and practice and that sort of thing. And it also gives us time to start training trainers. So it took us a long time to, to figure out how to break down the curriculum. This is very, it's a very dense curriculum. Uh, there's no, nothing fluffy in this thing at all. And how to, how to break it down to give our students time to practice, integrate, learn it, and then be able to teach it themselves. So we, um, you're absolutely right. The difference between prison and the outside world is they all have to live with each other. And they don't often do very well with that because they are forced together in a very unnatural, challenged environment where they have, you know, they're basically under strict control physical control at all times. And uh, they're there for a reason. They were, you know, many of them committed violence on the outside, especially if they're serving long sentences, which was our student population. <clears throat> so, I mean, I can't well, imagine, you know, if it was if it was my best friend in the entire world <laughs> being imprisoned with them uh, for you know, potentially decades. And, uh, and that's in the best of case, not to mention if I found out they kind of dabble in murder, um, <laughs> that would make things kind of awkward. Yeah. Some pretty violent stuff. So it, it's, it's just, it really is unimaginable. Well, what, here's, what's really incredible is that we didn't know what to expect. And both of us are lawyers. We had never, Neither one of us had ever practiced criminal law. We were both civil trial lawyers before we became mediators. And so we were pretty naive and innocent in many ways about the, about what happens at the end of the criminal justice system. And, but this is what we found. As we start teaching, in the beginning, there's a little bit of, there was always a little skepticism. But we built, we built trust. And we, we always showed up. We, and we always did exactly what we, we said we were going to do. And over a period of time, and our material is really transformative in the, in the sense that it transforms it transforms these incarcerated people from murderers, for example, to be becoming peacemakers. And you cannot go through that transforming process and not change dramatically as a human being. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what we wit- we witnessed it then, and we witness it now. Wow. Um, that the, the you cannot learn the skills that we teach and master them and not dramatically change yourself. So I want to get into those skills. I have one more question coming to mind at at least. I'm sure eight more will pop into my head as you're answering this. But what uh, I'm I'm also curious what your um, what your law background, the influence of your law background in when you started getting into peacekeeping, if if there was something from that that gave you uh, specific skills that you were able to apply to um, peacekeeping and or maybe the lens through which you saw peacekeeping differently than other people. Yeah, the, so there are a couple there are a couple of 
insights. First of all, my legal background, especially as a trial lawyer and as a law professor, has gives me deep insight into the technical side of a litigated dispute. I mediate both litigated and non-litigated disputes. A litigated dispute is a lawsuit that's going to get tried in front of a judge or an arbitrator or a jury. A non-litigated dispute is a conflict where there is no, there are no lawyers, there is no legal framework to define the conflict. Hmm. And those are more challenging uh, and more rewarding to work with, frankly, uh, than the litigated dispute. What I learned early on in my master's studies <clears throat> was that the law, the legal system is, as we have it, is really powerful. I mean, extremely useful. But we, we, have, we are asking it to do too much. Uh, the law is not suited for dealing with ambiguous public policy problems that the legislature refuses to address. And so people have to go to the courts and then judges who are not elected have to figure out what to do with that. We're just, the legal system is not designed for that. And yet, and yet, because of the, for the last 40 years or so, because of the way politics has evolved, um, judges are more and more judges are being asked to make policy decisions that they have no business making. Also, the law is not a the law is not a peacemaking system in the purest sense. the uh, The courtroom is a place for decision making. A decision has to be made. Did somebody do something wrong? And if so, what are the consequences? In a civil side, it would be how much money should be paid in reparation or in damages, as we would say. And in the criminal side, it would be what's the appropriate penal sentence, incarceration, probation, whatever it might be. So those that's all decision making. And the, the people who decide these, the, a jury or a judge, are simply making decisions and then telling the parties what their decision is. There's no dialogue between the parties in a courtroom. There is no attempt to reconcile differences. There's no attempt to restore relationships. None of that happens in the courtroom. So so that's why uh, that's one of the reasons why people hate lawyers so much mm -hmm. is because they it lawsuits typically make problems worse. Mm -hmm. They don't make problems better. This is true for uh, many situations, but there are many situations where a lawsuit is an efficient way of dealing with a problem, like an automobile accident with a stranger, you know, a lawsuit's the appropriate way to deal with that. And that brings in the insurance companies and it gets settled and there's money exchanged. And the other thing that is important, I, I taught this for a long time before I became a peacemaker, is that the, the only thing the law can, a judge can only do th three things. A judge can award, say somebody, a judge can make a statement saying, you, uh, issue a judgment saying, Bob owes Andy money because of a wrong. So can issue a judgment, can declare rights, basically look at a will or a deed or some other legal instrument and tell us what it means. And the third thing is to, is to issue a course of order, like an injunction or put somebody in prison. Mm -hmm. Those are the only, those are fundamentally, that's all a court can do. So on the money side, we are taking very complex problems, like even in a catastrophic injury case, and we're reducing human misery and human suffering to dollars and cents. And none of the emotional, none of the emotional stuff is taken into account. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's claims for emotional distress and things like that. But fundamentally, the, the, the sadness, the despair, all of that stuff, or the shame that maybe a defendant is feeling because of causing traumatic injury, none of that is accounted for in the law. And that's the, the law's that's it's failing mm -hmm. because it doesn't look at the human side of the equation, which is why now we have mediation, which is if it's done correctly, we can address a lot of these non-legal issues outside the courtroom in, a, in some kind of process that allows the parties to have some interaction if appropriate. Hmm. Yeah, it's very um, transactional. So it is. So, yeah. the, so it, 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 and it is by design. Mm -hmm. But that means that the human kinds of problems that most people have, like a barking dog or a trespass or something like that, are not well suited for judicial determination. Mm. 
because the underlying emotional issues are never addressed. Hmm. And so that's the big that's the big problem. On the other hand, if you have issues that are that the law is well suited for, such as, for example, enforcing a promissory note or foreclosing on a mortgage or a deed of trust or some other financial or transact you know contract law, the law is very good very good for the resolving those kinds of disputes. Hmm. So that's what I learned, and then and so when I'm in and then when I'm working with say a family business in a non-litigated dispute that we've got a family business conflict, whatever it might be. And there's a lot of wealth at stake and people can't afford to get go to lawyers. My legal training gives me a good insights into what could happen. What the, what, what is the disaster looming ahead <laughs> that I can talk about because of my deep experience and training. And I can also, um, in a mediated case, in a, in a litigated case, you know, I can, when it's appropriate, I can analyze the case and have my own personal opinion about how I think this thing is going to turn out. And if it's appropriate, offer an opinion, or at least start asking probing questions to get the lawyers representing the parties to start thinking about the case in ways that maybe they have either not thought about or refused to think about because they don't want to think about the weaknesses in their case. Mm. So that's kind of a long-winded answer to a really interesting question. I I love it, and I'm I'm so excited to hear about these strategies. I, I should I should share from a personal level. I'm I'm sure that this is not a um, foreign to you at this point, but I I feel like there's a, this is my first global pandemic, and what I'm noticing is that uh, it seems to make people upset. Uh, just, just, <laughs> just, just generally myself yeah. being one of those people, I, you know, I, I get, I get very frustrated. This is, this is, um, it, it, this is definitely the most tangibly uh, angry that I, I find myself being on a, on a somewhat regular ish, uh, basis. And it makes me think, have I always just had this underlying uh, thing? I always thought of myself as a chill person and like maybe I did always have a little bit of a temper there and everything. But it's definitely uh, it, it's I've definitely felt it. I've I felt more angry. I felt more frustrated. I'm definitely, uh, you know, social media or something like that is is a, a really good way to uh, um, uh, catalyze that anger and, and conflict. So you've already, been, you've already been angry and frustrated. Yeah, I have. Um, I mean, not all the time, but just more than I ever remember being in my life for sure. Right. And I'd certainly be, I, I would certainly like to be more of a peacekeeper than uh, an antagonist, which I sometimes can be on. The, I don't know. I, I mean, I do this, you know, talking with people in person or doing this show or anything. I, I'm a very, I'm a very chill person. And then I go online and have some conspiracy person put something in my comments and I <laughs> fucking flip and I, I'm kind of, I'm kind of surprised that it, that it bothers me as much as it does. And I get as worked up as I do, but cause I've never really thought of myself as that kind of person, but turns out I am sometimes I get a little revved up once in a while. So yeah, the social media is not a good place to hang out during the pandemic. <laughs> I really try to avoid it as much as I can. Yeah. You're a wiser uh, man than but me. But there are, there are techniques you can use to, deal with the snarkiness that won't get you upset. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, the, the, I think the, the pandemic is, as in many ways, removed the guardrails from social discourse. Mm -hmm. And I think social media was already trending in that direction. Yeah. But once people get stuck, you know, they're stuck in their apartment or they're stuck in their home and they can't do anything. And you can only watch so much Netflix. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you get on social media and, you, and people are frustrated and they're angry and they're alone and they're, feeling isolated and, you know, they, you know, maybe they get their, get, they get information that's not exactly accurate or mm -hmm. best for them. And then they start, they start spewing stuff out. Yeah. And the, the, so their anger and their emotional turmoil ends up all, for all to see in these different posts and tweets and stuff like that yeah i i wish i wish that when someone and it depends on the day sometimes uh some someone's like your bill gates 
shill for vaccines because I have a podcast that hardly anyone listens to. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we talk about science. And and on a, on a usual day, I'm like, wow, sounds like they're in a real rough place. And <laughs> that's, that's, that's right. if anything, just kind of amusing. And then other days it just hits me at the wrong time. And I'm right. just so frustrated. So we have, you know, yeah. we all have emotional elasticity. Yeah. So. So, and we, we have a certain amount of elasticity and when we're relaxed and rested and, and fed well, decent food, uh, we, we usually have a lot of elasticity, yeah. but if we're tired or we're stressed or we've been eating too many Big Macs, <laughs> uh, you know, we're going to, our little, our, that rubber band is going to get stretched out pretty tight right. and we don't have the capacity, the, the mental capacity in the brain to deal with the additional stress of an emotional situation. Mm -hmm. And what you're describing is very normal. Mm -hmm. Very normal. So, uh, so help us out with some strategies. What, uh, what can myself, what can others do if they want to uh, become more peacekeepers in life? Huh. Peace peacemakers. Peacemakers. Peacekeepers the is peacekeepers. a very different, that's like well-armed yeah. in a uniform. Exactly. Uh, the blue helmets in, yeah. blue in, the way, in Tanzania, right? <laughs> UN posted all over themselves. Peacemaker is like having a man bun and a weird long beard. And There, there you go. <laughs> so what, I, what I've learned and, and what I've learned both from, from studying neuroscience and also from many, many years of field experience is that there is only one surefire way to calm yourself down and to calm other people down when you're con con confronted with intense emotion. And it doesn't matter whether the emotion is positive or negative. You could have people deliriously happy and this works just as well. It works really good with, really well with children, small children, four, five, six, seven, eight years old. Mm. This skill is amazing. Um, the concept is called affect labeling. And basically what we were doing is what we were trained not to do as children. And what we were doing is listening to and reflecting back people's emotions. So we're telling them what they're feeling. And as children, we were told not to do that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. we were told that emotions were bad or evil. I mean, you remember when you were two years old running around, skid your knee, what were you told? Yeah, it was... Uh... Yeah, it was it was just a Stop lot of crying. dismissing. Be a big yeah. boy. Don't be a sissy. Don't be a girly right. girl. Be tough. That's been going on for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And it's the most insidious, pervasive form of emotional abuse that there is. The parents don't even know that they're deeply abusing their the little child's brain, but they are. Right. And the key the key here is understanding that we're ninety eight percent emotional and only two percent rational. And the people have a deep, deep, deep need to be validated emotionally. And when we validate those needs, magical things happen in our human brains. Our brains are hardwired uh, for receiving this information. So basically the, the, the technique is three steps. You can do it on yourself, self-affect labeling, or you can do third-party affect labeling. It's, and they're easy to describe, not always so easy to practice, but with practice, most people get it pretty quickly. So the three steps are number one, when you're with an angry person and you want to calm them down, ignore the words. It's all noise. Don't, don't listen to the words. It's just white noise. And you're not going to respond to those words either. So you're not going to justify, rationalize, appease, explain, apologize, nothing like that. All those words do is just make things worse. So you're going to ignore the words. The second thing you're going to do is you're going to read the emotional data fields of this angry person. Emotions are data, just like numbers on a spreadsheet. And we have an innate ability to efficiently and effortlessly and quickly read other people's emotions and understand exactly what they are. So the way you do that is to just be silent, still your mind if you can, and within a second or two, some emotions will start floating into your consciousness. So for an angry person, it's obvious they're angry, mm -hmm. uh, but there are almost always seven or eight emotions that are underneath the anger that you want to call out too. And then the third step is to reflect back those emotions with a very simple use statement. So Shane, you're really angry. This whole pandemic thing has got you really frustrated. You feel isolated. You feel alone. 
you feel disconnected from your friends and family and network of people that you want to hang around with. You don't feel supported. And the whole thing is making you sad. And, you, and you're really missing the loss of connection. And it pisses you off. And that's how you do it. Mm. That's all you say. And I ju will just keep labeling your emotions until you nod your head like you did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> your shoulder drops. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and you sigh, a relaxation sigh, sigh of relief, and say, yeah, that's exactly right. Mm. Takes about, depending on the person in the context, anywhere between 30 and 90 seconds mm -hmm. for that to happen. And what the brain scanning studies show, this is out of Lieberman's lab at UCLA. Matt Lieberman? Is that when you, Matthew Lieberman. Yeah, I had him on the show. Yeah. Looks like Matt Brilliant. Damon. Brilliant. Wrote Brilliant some book man. about social behavior. Yeah, so is the, the social brain, I mm -hmm. think, was his book. Came out a couple of years ago. Interestingly, in that book, he doesn't talk about it, his ethic labeling studies, which was back in 2007. Mm -hmm. um, however, uh, what his brain scanning studies show is that when you label somebody's emotions, the uh, it immediately inhibits the amygdala, amygdalae, we have two of them, and other limbic systems that are involved in the neural networks around strong emotions. All that, all that stuff gets inhibited. And at the same time, in an inverse correlation, the, the uh, ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, the executive center of the brain, comes back online. So we get people back, their cognitive function returns as we affect label. And it seems counterintuitive. Why, why is it that if I tell you what your emotions are, that you calm down and you can start to regain control of yourself? And for that, for that reason, Lieberman didn't exactly, in his seminal study, didn't, didn't really address that. But then we turn to the work of Lisa Feldman Barrett, who's a neuroscientist out of Northeastern University. Mm. And she's got a proponent of what she calls the constructed theory of emotions, which is brilliant. And basically, we are not born with emotions. We have to create emotions, and we start creating emotions in our brains at around 18 months of age. And it's through a process of emotional categorization and granularization, where we have all this affective experience that we are born with, and we have to label every single different kind of experience we have with a word. And that is that word association with the affective experience is what we call emotion. Mm -hmm. So what I think is going on here is that in normal circumstances, our ventral lateral prefrontal cortex has access to an emotional database that we start creating at the time of about 18 months of age. And, and we can very generally associate broad emotions with words pretty easily. Most people can. Uh, <clears throat> but when we become emotional, highly emotional, we become alexithemic. In other words, that database gets cut off. We can no longer label our own emotions. And the, prefrontal, the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex is overwhelmed by the emotional centers of the brain. It, and it literally can no longer function. And now we are back to affective reactivity, which is basically our childhood programming. How did we behave before we started learning emotional self-regulation. And that's why when you see people who are upset, you say they're acting like six-year-olds. Mm -hmm. Well, because in that moment, they are literally six years old. And what we do, so what happens when we affect label, when I label somebody else's emotions, I reflect back their emotional experience, tell them how they're feeling. I'm giving them, I'm lending them my database of emotions that allows them to access their database. Mm. And as soon as that happens, their brain writes itself and equanimity is restored and they calm down. That's, uh, that's interesting. I did a, uh, I did a, um, episode very recently called the knowledge illusion, uh, authors of the book, the knowledge illusion, why we never think alone. And the, I mean, I, I, I think the, the big, um, the the big premise that comes through it's a really really well written book um is that we like to think of our our mind as just 
this thing that's inside of our skull and everything that's in there is everything that we that we know but we're social animals and social thinkers and so that's right. our our mind is actually this i guess this this kind of relates to a little bit of Matthew Lieberman's work as well kind of our uh, the amount of knowledge that we have is also de- uh, dependent on the people that we're around because we that's have right. access to their knowledge as well so that's that's, right. uh, that's an interesting I, I guess I'd never really thought about it um in this particular way before though so uh i i can't process emotion very well right now but your faculties are (laughs) are are intact and so i can actually use your um your ability to label to understand myself is that is that sort of the idea of what's going on here when you can when you when you're feeling like you're getting upset you can self-ethic label saying i'm feeling frustrated i'm Mm -hmm. angry i'm pissed off Hmm. And it has the same effect. Now, what about, there's another component to, uh, what is anger for exactly? Because I'm, I'm also wondering how much of, how much of anger is a way of kind of, uh, social bargaining and a, a way of like making threats or trying to get what, what you want and sometimes um maybe validating that emotion is is in fact kind of um subconsciously getting that person what what they want which is maybe to feel heard or be acknowledged well absolutely yeah. i mean when somebody's really ang- anger is usually indicates some kind of boundary violation mm-hmm. and there of course there are all different kind many different kinds of anger and there's trait-based anger as well as incidental anger. I mean, there are biologically lots of different ways of thinking about anger. But fundamentally, in my experience, having dealt with thousands and thousands of conflicts and trained tens of thousands of people, what I've seen is that when people are angry, they have a deep need to be heard and validated. And when you meet that need, by reflecting back their emotional experience, Mm. they immediately calm down and and feel, not only did they feel heard, I call it listening other people into existence. Not only did they feel like they've been listening into existence, but they they are extremely grateful that you've taken the time, that I've taken the time or anybody's taken the time to really listen to what they're feeling. People don't wanna be told what they're saying. They wanna be told what they're feeling. Mm. They want, they want validation of their feelings. And since we live in a culture of emotional invalidation, like I described before, the little two-year-old, that we live in a culture of emotional invalidation. Our feelings are never validated by each other. And, there, and, and the, 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 the soothing effect, as Lieberman has established in his lab studies around this, the soothing effect is extremely profound. Mm-hmm. That's why we, that's why in the prison project, prison of peace project, this is the very first skill we teach because it's foundational to everything else. If you can listen, we, we talk about, we teach the six needs of justice, vengeance, vindication, validation, the need to be heard, the need to create meaning and the need for safety. And basically what we tell our students is all of those needs are met and the need for vengeance goes away when you meet the need to be heard, when you validate people deeply by emotional reflection. Mm. People feel they may disagree with the outcome. They may disagree with the, you know, over over the surface stuff. But underneath, they calm down and feel like there's been justice, even though they they may lose. Mm. And that's consistent with a lot of other research that's been done over the years, um, going all the way back to Thibault and Walker back in the fifties and sixties, on theories around justice and the psychology psychology of justice and that sort of thing. Mm. Long before neuroscience came in the mainstream. Going back to something that you said that caught my attention that I actually wasn't uh, familiar with. Could you break down anger a little bit more for us? Actually, when you, when you were talking about trait-based anger and some of the other categorizations, I, I wasn't mm-hmm. familiar. Yeah, so there are, I just happen to have my cheat sheet right here. I didn't know you were going to ask the question. There are... Uh, 
there are many, many different kinds of anger. I'll just read off my cheat sheet. I'll just read the different kinds of anger that we can deal with. You can have anger avoidance where you're angry underneath, but because it's a uh, taboo to be angry, you avoid it but it's still simmering and boiling underneath. It's like a volcano that's going to explode. You can have sneaky anger, where again, it's passive aggressive because you're in a low power position. <coughs> and so you've got to say yes and do no. So you tend to sabotage. Mm. Uh, you've got paranoid anger, where you believe that everybody is out to get you. You've got sudden reactive anger. These are people who have a hair trigger responses to insults. Maybe they live in an honor society, such as in the Deep South, where honor is very important. And the slightest, this is identity conflict, the slightest threat to that provokes that, immediate that is, violent reaction. Uh, that, that is such a, a such a mind-blowing um, concept for, I, I think, for people to hear about us. Is the this idea of these cultures of honor and and just mm, just yeah. the the subtleties and complexities that that built these uh, frameworks of of personality as we see expressed? Do you think it's uh, you think it's just some individual that uh, that has this aspect of their personality? But there's all of these incredible influences. I think. It, it, what it, the culture of honor, th those were sheep herders around around Europe tended to uh, tended to I, I think rather than doing agriculture, if you're a herder, there was a lot more to there's a lot more to lose. Someone could steal your whole herd very easily. Sorry. And so there was a there was a, a lot more of this this culture of honor, this honor, this way of um punishing or at least showing the ability to punish um, a lot more, being more quick to punish um, wrongdoers potentially protected their their livelihood and their herds. And then those people ended up moving, um, immigrating to the south because there's a lot of cattle ranching and stuff. And, and so and then so look some at, of that disposition uh, uh, we find today in the in the south. Right. And look at look at look at Texas. I mean, the Texas legislature passed and Abbott signed into an open carry law. You can carry any weapon you want. Mm -hmm. You don't need a permit. You don't need mental background checks. You can carry AK-47. You can carry whatever you want. Texas has always traditionally been an honor culture. Mm -hmm. And so why is it that a legislature would do something so stupid as to allow anybody to carry a weapon of mass murder, open carry with no permit? It's because Traditionally, Texas has been an, a culture of yeah. honor, and there is no trust in the government to protect one's honor. Mm -hmm. And so the legislature, in its ultimate ignorance, has decides to provide a means for men, mostly, to protect their honor by carrying around a firearm that says, I'm going to shoot you dead if you get in my way. Yeah. Because there's no trust in government to be able to protect people or protect their so-called rights. Yeah. So we see it today. Yeah. I mean, in, in 2021, this idea of honor society manifests itself in really strange and weird ways. This is and in dangerous ways. And by the way, for uh, for the listeners, um, you know, this isn't always the best time to do a science experiment is when you're in a subway and you see someone walk in with a, <laughs> with a rocket launcher and be like, Oh, excuse me, sir. Are you by chance? I'm curious if, if you've been influenced by these cultures of honor. Could you tell me a little bit right. about your background? Well, that's actually a really good question to ask. I teach, I teach how do, how do you have a calm conversation with the politically polarized? Mm. And the first question is, well, tell me about your life history that leads you to the beliefs that you hold today. Interesting. So that really is a good question mm. to ask, um, to find it, to find out about cultures. Of Just here's, harder here's to do I when wanted. someone has a rocket launcher attached. So. <laughs> exactly. So what what happens? What happens is what, what culture in cultures of honor. What you'll typically find is that people are not very sophisticated. They're typically not well educated, and they have very very few identities around which they can form a personality. People who have very rich and diverse personality, I mean, uh, identities, they have a lot of identities as to who they are and what they do. Mm -hmm. They do not live in honor societies. 
they tend to aggregate in urban areas. And so we're going to see rural people having more honor societies because they have less identity than people who live in urban areas. And so the kinds of they, the people who have these identities around their honor will tend to become angry mm -hmm. quick, much more quickly, more reactive and violent than people uh, than people who have rich identities. And we see this in prison too, in the prison work, that one of the one of the reasons why prison peace works so well is now inmates or incarcerated or incarcerated students take on the mantle of peacemaker and mediator. That's a huge identity, positive identity, probably maybe the first positive identity they've ever had in their life. And not only do they take that mantle on, they know and have the confidence, they have the skills to stop violence mm. and they they can do that and so they change and shift as a result of that um s s and that's part of uh, i mean when we talk about pol the polarization we see today a, lo a large part of that is around identity and i threatened identity s and because people don't have rich identities when they're living in the rural south for example mm. that is interesting i can be a bit of a chameleon i don't know I don't know where I stand. I've I've traveled all over the place, and so actually, yeah, I do. Every time I every time I run into a friend I haven't seen in a couple of years, they're usually like, "I wonder what Shane I'm going to get this time around." I'm usually <laughs> I'm usually a very different person. Um, but well, you've had a lot of life experiences, yeah. so you have a lot of different identities. Yeah, yeah, and that and that's there. You know that that's the really the vaccination against honor based. Violence, for example. Well, it's it's also, I mean, I think this is slightly related, but it, it's also, it's it's difficult to have the same kind of fears or judgments of, say, outgroups when you've got to spend a bunch of time with them, <laughs> you know, when, right. you, when you have a lot of experience, no That's longer right. is this a group, this is someone you can identify with. That's right. And all the science shows that you, the more time you spend with people, mm -hmm. the more you find you have in common and the less stereotyping that goes on and the more individualized they become. In fact, one of the major problems in peacemaking, and this is really true in international conflicts, is that if you're mediating or, or working as a peacemaker in a, in a conflict where you're representing party representatives or stakeholder representatives, you have to be very careful not to get them moving too quickly to peace. Mm -hmm because they will bond with each other over time as they engage in all these processes we use to get them to talk and respect each other. They will get way ahead of their constituencies and maybe they'll reach an agreement and they'll go back and they haven't prepared their stakeholders or constituencies and it's like a surfer being out on the edge of the way. They get too far out and they crash and they're done. Mm. There have been plenty of peacemakers who have been killed by their, by their constituencies because they move too quickly, too fast. Um, yeah, yeah, and so as a mediator, you have to be very cognizant. Who are you representing? How? And sometimes you have to go back and you have to spend time working with the stakeholder groups mm. to bring them along at the same pace that you're bringing along your um, the actual representatives. This has well hmm. been well documented and examined in, in the labor management negotiations where you've got labor representatives representing a large <coughs> group of people, workers in a union, and they make, they, um, sometimes they make concessions too quickly. They come to a deal too quickly. That the, that the groups the right that deal. they it's are the right representing deal. feel like and they are like being they sold out. represented. That's right. I so see. that's why you see in labor negotiation, hmm. you'll see labor taking a really hard nosed position that's completely ridiculous and unreasonable. But they have to do it as part of the theater of the peacemaking process hmm. to satisfy their constituents. Hmm. That's interesting. No, and you and you even see the same kind of stuff with uh, you know with politicians today who think that they are catering to a certain coalition or a certain population group or a certain demographic or a certain belief group. They'll put out these just idiotic sound bites. I mean, it's just stupid, beyond stupid. Hmm. But it's to agitate their, their, the people that they want to agitate to keep them stirred up to vote for them. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with public policy. It has nothing to do with good governance. Mm. 
it has everything to do with staying in relationship with your stakeholder group. Hmm. So, hmm. that is interesting. Um, I, I guess uh, going going back to these uh, to the prison work that you've done and the. I guess it doesn't necessarily need to be that, but there must be so many individual differences and there must be people that have a kind of a leg up and are, are take to the training faster than other people. Say you say you're going to a prison, you have, it's a crisis situation. You have a very short amount of time and few resources. You, you need to get, a couple peacekeepers trained as soon as possible. Peacemakers, uh, right? Sorry, peacemakers, not peacekeepers. Peacemakers trained as soon as possible. What are the what are the things that that you use to identify people that are going to more naturally and easily take to this, and which ones are going to be a little more work? Interesting. Interestingly. All of our programs are volunteer. Okay. So people people just come because they're interested, and they come for all kinds of different reasons, um, and they self select in and they self select out. We find that, say, out of if we start with a group of say twenty five students, at the end we'll have maybe fifteen complete the course, and be be really effective, and they they've they turn out to be really powerful advocates for the work because they have learned it, they've mastered it, and their lives have changed. I can't tell you who is going to be successful and who isn't. Mm. Um, a lot of times, sometimes it has to do with, I'm tired of being an asshole. I want to, I want to do something good with my life. That drives a lot of stuff. Sometimes it's, I'm tired of the violence and I want to learn something new. Sometimes it's just, wow, two well-known lawyers coming into prison to teach us. I got to do that. Pure curiosity. Sometimes it's, I'm bored out of my tears. I'm bored out of my gourd. What else to do? I'll go sit in prison at peace. That's, that is interesting though, that it's, uh, that implied within that is that it does, there needs to be some level of willingness. It does need to be something that it's a choice they are making. It's, That's correct. This isn't mandated uh, peacemaking. No. <laughs> It would never right. work if it were mandated. Mm. So we've learned over the years that people, and then what happens is as our students come in and they realize that it's a lot of work. We work their butts off. And because we know that they're going to be put into dangerous situations and they need to have, their skills have to be flawless. There is zero room for error in a prison when you're dealing with inmate to inmate fights, arguments, and violence. People die. So we were very cognizant at the beginning that we had to teach skills that worked the first time every time without fail, and that our students had to master these skills. So we, so it's rigorous. Well, many, many inmates are not used to the rigors of studying mm -hmm. and reading and doing homework and being accountable and showing up. So we lose students that way, but other students learn the rigor and they learn that by doing what we tell them to do and being internally self-disciplined that they can accomplish a lot. And, and so that's fun to see too, but you never know. You never know who we've worked in level four, high maximum security prisons. I worked for three years at Corcoran state prison. I was teaching a hundred feet from Charles Manson's cell hmm. and working with men coming out of gangs who are some of the most violent individuals in the world. I, one of my best mediators, one of my best students years ago was the founder of the Aryan Brotherhood. Uh, an amazing man. That's the other thing. Some of these people are brilliant. Mm -hmm. And and so you just, we go in with no judgment. So here's what we have. Here's what we'll teach you. Here are our, here are our requirements. Mm. And we pass no judgment on who they are or what they've done. We don't care. Mm. Interesting. And by the way, since since there is a, I don't want to forget to mention this because since there is a a, a willingness necessary for all of this, I, I'm sure that there's uh, many people like me that would 
like to improve a bit more in this in this category <laughs> and i know that you have uh some courses actually available online as right. well right I so do. doug and noel yeah, uh, n-o-l-l dot com is the website what kind of courses do you have there i have and i'll give you another uh link to a page that i made just for the listeners of your show right today uh that i created so the, I have courses on how to de-escalate, and I've got courses that go deeper than that, how to develop your emotional competency, which is deeper, deeper and broader than just learning how to calm somebody down. Same basic ideas, but just taken at a deeper, deeper level. And, and we get into much more, more sophisticated areas than just the basic skill of affect labeling and learning how to calm somebody down. So the page that I created is dugnoll.co, not, not com, dugnoll.co slash here we are. All one word. Dugnoll.co slash here we are. Okay. Yeah. And what happens when you land on that page is that you can get a free ebook that describes the de-escalation skills and where it came from. Give me your email ad address. You won't get many emails from me, I promise. Uh, but I got to have a release to send it to. Mm -hmm. And then you can also buy my book, Deescalate, my fourth book. And you can then buy the Deescalate course. And you can also sign up for the emotional competency courses if you're interested in that. And, and in the emotional competency courses, uh, after you finish the basic course, you get a half an hour of consultation with me. And if you want more coaching and more support, of course, we can talk about that. I also do a lot of virtual workshops. So if you got a group, uh, that in customer service, or I work with a lot in the healthcare, physicians groups, people, wherever you have, wherever you've got conflict and you need to have good, clear understandings and be able to calm people down and be emotionally self-aware. I can teach, I teach groups how to do this. I teach leaders how to do this stuff because it, it's so powerful. And all of that's basically available on the website. So once you get in, then you can explore around the website. I've got a I don't know, 100 blog articles, a lot of resources. So great. Yeah, I just lots of good I wanted stuff. to make sure and plug the heck out of that. But let's let's go back into just because uh, hopefully some of this stuff people uh, that we talk about today will stick with people a little while uh, for a little while. And then they'll two months later be like, you know what? That was beneficial. I'm going to go back and explore that more. So we had... And that's what usually happens. <laughs> we had number one was ignore the words. Um, Correct. Number two was affect label. Uh, uh, number two was read the emotional data fields. Read the emotional data fields. Can you kind of explain that again? Sure. So we all have emotions and we're all emotional all the time. Sometimes our emotions are dominant. Sometimes they're quiescent, but we're always emotional. Uh, and we give off those emotions primarily through our eyes and our voice, mm -hmm. tone of voice, vocal uh, uh, vocality, not the words. The words do not, ex our words almost never express emotion. So our brains over millions of years of evolution are hardwired to read the emotions of other people. And let me explain that a little bit because that people think that's a little weird. We've only had vocabulary, the language as a species for 230,000 years. Our vocabulary, our ability to speak and form words and begin to think abstractly coincided with the mastery of fire. And with the mastery of fire came the ability to render animal fat into digestible calories which allowed for a huge expansion in brain capacity and a huge expansion in the pharyngeal nerve and pharyngeal muscles that control our larynx and speaking apparatus. And that all happened around 230,000 years ago. But hominids have been on the planet for millions of years. Mm -hmm. And they communicated. They just didn't communicate through language. Mm -hmm. And so we have this innate ability that has been finely honed over millions of years of evolution to read each other's emotions. Now, the question is, why don't we do this? Well, that's because around 4,000 years ago, as civilization started to form and philosophers started thinking about what's it all about, Alfie, they, they started drawing a very wrong conclusion. And that is that to be rational is to be good and to be emotional is to be bad. It's epitomized in Plato, in, uh, 
in the Phaedrus and Aristotle, uh, and it carried forth into the Western world, and that we have this myth that we're rational beings. And as a result of that, we've been trained that emotions are bad, they're evil, they're weak, irrational. Mm -hmm. All these pejoratives around emotions. So we've never learned how to read another person's emotions, except at the most rudimentary level. I mean, you got to be gobsmacked with somebody's anger before you realize they're really pissed off. Mm -hmm. When in fact, we have the ability, if we're just willing to pay attention, to get very nuanced about what people are experiencing and be able to, to, to understand it efficiently. And by efficient, I mean fast and effortless. And, and we're incredibly accurate with our ability to do that. We just have to practice it. We just have to work with it. So that's the second step. And the way we do that, the way we do that is to simply be in silence. Silence your mind. I'm in front of you, Shane, and you're ranting and raving, and I'm just going to be in silence. I'm just going to wait for the emotions. What are the? I'll ask myself, what are the emotions he's experiencing? My brain will do all pre-conscious processing very fast. We'll do all the processing, and all of a sudden, they'll start to flow into my head. And then all I have to do is the third step, reflect back what's coming into my head to you with a you statement. Oh, man, you're really pissed off. You're angry. You're frustrated. You feel completely disrespected. Nobody's listening to you. You feel completely unsupported. You know, you're, you're anxious and frightened and sad. And you've lost this connection. You feel abandoned and all alone. and Nobody loves you. And the whole thing's just really, really making you mm -hmm. angry. You're enraged. Mm -hmm. And that's all you do. You don't ask questions. You don't use I statements. You don't try to explain, justify, appease, apologize. Never. I teach my students, never apologize until you've calmed people down. Mm. Because you don't know whether you're at fault or not until you get people calmed down. Mm. So oftentimes people will try to apologize thinking, well, if I apologize and take the blame for whatever is going on, this person will calm down. It almost always enrages people, makes them even matter. Interesting. Because what is it that people want? They don't want apology. They don't want the problem fixed. They don't want explanations mm. or justifications. They want to be heard right. at a deep emotional level. Satisfy that need. Life is good. Wonderful. Well, it, this, is, uh, this has been a fantastic chat. I'm uh, really excited about your work. I can't wait to dig into it more. Thank you for uh, joining me today and sharing You're your welcome, uh, your book, Deescalate: um, How to Oh, uh, there we go. How to calm an angry person in ninety seconds or less. Um, Doug Noel dot co slash Here we are. Is that the special link for? Yeah, that'll work. That's a special page for just the people listening to the show. Fantastic. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much for everything that you do and taking the time to talk with me today. It's been fun, Shane. Thanks thank a you. lot. And thank you listeners for being such wonderful, curious people. We'll talk with you more next week.